Vin Scully Show, number 0015, air, uh, VTR 12473, take one. From Television City in Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen, Vin Scully! Very nice of you. Thank you. Thank you. Fine. Thank you so very, very, very much. And how nice that you could join us this afternoon. I was going to say we have a great show, but I have really gotten afraid of the word great. Really, I just never use it anymore. I had a friend of mine who had a hearing problem, and a couple of days later I saw him, and he said to me, I have the greatest hearing aid in the world. He said, I can hear a leaf fall a block away. A drop of water in the basin sounds like an explosion. I can hear tears three houses away. It is the greatest hearing aid I have ever had. I said, what kind is it? He said, about quarter of nine. <laughs> anyway. Oh, that's all right. Oh, okay. no, you're, you're friends, so, you know, we'll just, a smile and a nod. That's fine, that's fine. Our guest today, I just can't wait to get him out of here, so I'm not going to waste any more time, is Mr. Carol O'Connor, and we'll have him here in one minute, right after this question. You know, it has to be a good omen for any new show, such as ours, to have this next gentleman as our guest. He's the star of television's number one series, All in the Family. Would you please welcome Mr. Carol O'Connor. <laughs> Sure, it is great to have you with us, indeed. Thank you very much. Carol O'Connor. We just finished a rehearsal upstairs. Doing and, another uh, Archie Bunker. Yes, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I think it's about the sh show number 19 of this season. We just finished the rehearsal upstairs, and uh, because of our friendship, I came down here. Oh, bless your there. heart. Thank you so very much. You are, without a doubt, let's, let's face it, a gigantic success. Was this your ambition as an actor? Did you really want to be a big star? I never wanted to be an actor at all, as a matter of fact. Hmm. I, uh, I wanted to be a teacher, and I was studying to be a teacher in school, but I was in a school play. When I say school, I mean college. I was in a college play, and it was uh, by Chekhov. And uh, a professional producer came in to see the show, saw me in the play, and offered me a part in a professional uh, production. This was in Dublin, Ireland. And I took the part, and uh, I was okay in it, and then the producer asked me to be in something else, and one thing led to another, and that's how I got into this thing. Hmm. One thing leading to another. You go from an obscure play in Ireland to a smash on American television, and you have become a rather, what do they say, a hot item in the movie magazines, the fan magazines. They've written some dandy stories about you. Uh, one of the fan magazines, and I must say something about fan magazines, you must never believe anything you read about anybody in the fan <laughs> magazine. <laughs> Nobody ever willingly gives an interview to one of these fan magazines. Well, they take interviews that are given with uh, newspapers and so forth, and they build stories on these. And one of the amusing ones that came out last year was uh, Carol and Jean. The twenty-year love that has held them together. <laughs> Gene Stapleton. Gene Stapleton. Oh, my. Gene Stapleton. Did you know Gene well before the uh, the well, series? Well, I knew Gene before the series. We had done a couple of television uh, dramatic shows together uh, in New York. Uh, uh, oh, about uh, about eleven, twelve years ago. Mm. So we knew each other, but uh, there was no twenty-year. Uh, a love affair going on. <laughs> Fess up now, honest scout's oath, honest engine. Were you terrified of the role that you were about to play, a bigot? It uh, 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 was a frightening role. How did you feel when they said, how about doing this? No, I wasn't terrified of it, but I didn't think the people would like it. I didn't think the... Uh, I didn't really have enough confidence in uh, our American public to... Uh, 
uh, to look at one of their own. I'm not saying that Archie is everybody, but Archie is a lot of people. And uh, I didn't think that the people would be able to look at Archie and uh, accept him as one of their own, and I didn't think we'd get away with it. I thought they'd, uh, I thought that such a storm of protest would go up that we'd be off the air in a few weeks. You are such a natural for the role. Were you the first choice? And I don't mean as a bigot, you know. <laughs> You know what I mean? You just, you're just so convincing. Why don't you say it? You're such a fine actor. <laughs> were, were, were you the, the, the producer's first choice? Well, I think, uh, yes. Uh, they, so they tell me, uh, and I have no reason to disbelieve it. I heard a rumor. That's why I brought it up. I honestly did. I heard a rumor that the first choice for Archie Bunker was Mickey Rooney. <laughs> I, no, I really, I heard that. Well, that's right. Now, somebody at our show at the warm-up session asked uh, Norman Lear about that one night, and, uh, and, and he said that they had thought about Mickey Rooney. I guess they wanted a bigger bigot. A bigger yeah. bigot. <laughs> Are you... Uh, Archie Bunker is now exploited. He's on T-shirts and lunch pails, and just about everywhere you turn, you can see Archie Bunker's face, which means Carol O'Connor's face. Therefore, when you think of the name Carol O'Connor, you think of Archie Bunker and vice versa. Are you afraid, as an actor, that you have suddenly painted yourself in a corner and you will henceforth and forever be Archie Bunker? Well, as, not as far as the public is concerned. I think the public are able to make the distinction very, very well. But you know, in our business, uh, producers uh, sometimes feel that if a fellow has played a certain thing or a lady has played a certain thing, that that particular actor can't play anything else. And uh, the fear really is, it, is within the profession. The, f the fear is not, uh, it's nothing to do with the public. The public will accept you in a new role, a different kind of role. Uh, I have no worry on that score, but I am worried about producers. It would be uh, definitely a deprivation for all of us if the producers did not back you, really, because then we'd miss a, a fine actor and the many sides of him. Thank you very much. I hope everybody feels that way. Well, uh, yeah, I certainly do. Okay. We'll uh, learn a lot more about Archie, ba I mean, uh, Carol O'Connor, right after this message. Oh, gosh, that was a good dinner that your wife served. I, I, you know, I really feel at home here, sir. I've been meaning to talk to you about that. Well, now, now, don't get sore. I only had uh, six chicken legs. I don't care how many legs you had. I'm talking about something else. Uh, about what, sir? Well, you've been seeing my daughter for uh, about six months now. Yeah, that's right. It's the happiest six months of my life. Young man, come right out with it. Are your intentions honorable or dishonorable? You mean I have a choice? <laughs> There's tremendous interest in you and in Gene, everybody on the cast and the show. And we were talking a minute ago about how you felt. But I think to really sum up the, the dynamism of this man, this Archie Bunker, uh, we have a small film clip. And of course, week after week you make the shows. This particular scene that we have, Archie is being informed by the other members of the family uh, about some rather impressive news. As for this guy here, I think his underwear's too tight. <laughs> Wrong on all counts. If you're all through, Daddy, we want to tell you the surprise now. Something I heard you talk about a hundred times. You and the meathead got yourselves your own apartment. Oh, Daddy, no. <laughs> Mom and I went to the doctor. Archie? What if I was to tell you that I think you're going to have the little boy you always wanted? <laughs> Holy cow, Edith, can't you do nothing right? You know, it's so true, a marvelous actor can do so much. Your look there was absolutely priceless. 
Is it, is it very hard to time that kind of a look, or is it just, uh, has it been something that's second nature to you? When you just turn and stare at her, everybody roars. Well, it's partly finding, uh, you, you do as an actor become uh, the person to some extent, you know, you get into it. And uh, part of it is uh, finding the answer, but also part of it is waiting for an audience laugh. I don't know where one ends and the other begins, but uh, it all comes out right as far as the audience uh, goes. That's a very interesting scene, though, because they, uh, they uh, evidently uh, Archie and Edith uh, are doing something right, otherwise the question would never come yeah, up. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, yet on other shows, they, they, uh, they imply that Archie and Edith have uh, no sex life at all. There are jokes made about that, you see. So, well, we haven't quite figured that out yet, whether, whether they have... Uh, uh, whether they have a good life, let me put it that yeah. way. Together. The fan magazines have. What are they? What are they? <laughs> about you, I mean. Oh, oh, oh yes, in real life. Yeah. But I'm talking about uh, I'm talking about the characters. Right. It's interesting how a television series goes along and how you how you you find things and you find realities about one another and you decide what to play and what does she really think about him and what does he think about her and all of that is a, a subject of constant discussion during rehearsals. You'd be surprised. Uh, we can spend a whole hour uh, talking about uh, one little thing, one little, uh, uh, one little exchange between, between husband and wife. Not only would a husband and wife say this sort of thing to each other, but would this particular husband and wife say this? And then we refer to other shows. No, we can't say that because in another show, we said that he was only making that much money. And if he was only making that much money, then he can't say this because that would indicate that he's making more than that. And uh, we, we go into this very, very deeply. Let me ask you something about Archie Bunker. Is he a real person? Is he one man that you knew? Is he a lot of people no, that you've uh, met? Or have you yes, just created that's him? that's right. He's a lot of people. He's a lot of people that I've met. Uh, uh, he has really nothing to do with, with uh, my own personal life. But he is, I uh, see, I'm an actor of, uh, of, of, of the mirror up to life school. You know that Hamlet said to the players, uh, hold, as it were, the mirror up to life. I'm really a reporter. You know what that is. I think so. I do. And uh, uh, I observe uh, how people are and how they sound and how they behave in different situations, and I report on that. And I'm reporting on uh, not only one man that I've known, but on, on a composite of, uh, of many men that I've known. I'm making that report. And uh, well, that's all it is. You don't have to... Uh, be the character you're playing as an actor. I don't have to be a murderer to play Richard III. And I'd love to play Richard III mm -hmm. someday. Uh, I don't have to be a, a drunk uh, to play Hickey in, one, in, in Nice Man Cometh or something like that. But if I've seen enough of these characters and I've observed enough about them, then I can report to to you on them. What about the words um, meathead, dingbat? Is any of that you, or was that, was that all manufactured by the writers? No, that was all manufactured by the writers, yes. It's not a mannerism of one of these people that you met in your No, life. I never used the word uh, dingbat. Uh, uh, I've, I've used uh, other similar terms, but I've never used dingbat. <laughs> <laughs> there are scary words on that show when you start talking about various races. Now, uh, if I want to talk about an Irishman and call him a Mick, that's not much. But they get into rougher words than that, which I guess is just holding that mirror up to life. Yes, we all know in this country that those words are used. We've all heard those words. And uh, if we're going to faithfully report this character, then we, we use those words. Did we... you find it difficult? No. I thought it was just doing a faithful job of reporting. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to do with me. I'm just acting the role. Good. We're delighted to hear that. <laughs> indeed. We'll be right back again with Carol O'Connor right after this one minute. Pause. <laughs> That's a little lowercase blues. That's not the normal HB that I know. What's the matter with you? 
Oh, man, my girl, Nancy, you know. Last night she turned down my proposal. Well, how in the world could Nancy turn down your proposal of marriage? Who said anything about marriage? Well, we're back with Carol O'Connor. You know, Carol, yesterday we had Bob Newhart on the show, and Bob is a very close friend with that dynamic comedian Don Rickles, and he mentioned the fact that you're good buddies with Don. How in the world did that all come about? Well, we met, we were doing a picture uh, about World War II in Yugoslavia. And uh, although it was a picture about France, curiously enough, Europe, for those who haven't been over there lately or over there at all, it's changed so much since World War II that although we were doing a picture about the American armies in France, uh, there's no place in France today that looks like it did in 1944. But there are places in Yugoslavia, so the picture was shot over there where we could get a village that approximated France. And anyway, Don and I were making this uh, movie, and we became very good friends at that time, and been good friends ever since. You, uh, when you are good friends with Rickles, you are in a constant battle of wits, because he <laughs> is, uh, he's constantly on and going. Have you ever gotten the best of him? Well, I tell you, no, but when Don is off, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's quite serious. He's, uh, talks about uh, uh, business, or uh, uh, politics, or the affairs of the, the interest mm -hmm. to all of us. And uh, uh, he's, he's not so much on, unless, of course, uh, something gets him started, yeah. you know. The many sides of Don Rickles, which immediately triggers the thought, the many sides of Carol O'Connor, actor, now in a television series, a smash. You also, I understand, have a nightclub act that you will do in Las Vegas. And to be honest, uh, I wonder, what does Carol O'Connor do in a nightclub in Las Vegas? Well, I've already done it in Las Vegas. I did it last year. I played Harris Club in Reno and the Riviera in uh, Las Vegas. And, uh, well, I came on with my television character commenting on the world and uh, uh, the way uh, he would comment on, on the world. And then uh, after that, I did uh, about 15 minutes of songs. I'd already done a an album of songs from the 1930s, and uh, the, uh, so I, well, that's Funny it. you should mention the album <laughs> as he carefully took it out of his sleeve. This album, it says, Carol O'Connor Remembering You, and what's interesting about it particularly, the songs go from 1930, just a memory, through 1939, Remembering You. Why did you pick the era of the 30s? Well, the, the fellow that wrote the closing theme uh, to our show, All in the Family, a man named Roger Kellaway, a very talented musician, uh, I wrote the lyrics uh, uh, to it, and uh, we made a single on it, and uh, we were in, well, both of us interested in the music of the 1930s, and uh, we just decided we'd, we'd do a whole album on it, and we got some very good musicians together, and, uh, and we did that. Well, I don't know. It was the, year, the years I was growing up, you know. And, and you always look back on your uh, uh, adolescent years with something of a nostalgic fondness. And I always liked those uh, songs of the 1930s, the ones in that album. I hope you all get a hold of it and uh, know what we're talking about. You wonder what we're talking about unless you buy this album. <laughs> And, uh, Carol, you have come a long way from a Chekhov play in Ireland. Just how Irish are you? How much uh, time did you spend over in the old sod? Well, I was uh, born in New York, but uh, I, I, I'm pretty Irish. It's like uh, an Englishman was once asked. Uh, he, uh, he was an Englishman, but he was born in Tasmania. And they said, uh, but uh, how can you call yourself English? You were born in Tasmania. And he replied, well, you know, if the if the cat has kittens in the oven, you don't call them biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess, uh, I guess no matter what we are, uh, we're, we're born in this country, but we do come from uh, national origins of, abroad. Many of us, some of us can't remember. We've been here so long, but my, my parentage hasn't been here that long. I'm, uh, uh, second generation. How long were you in Ireland? I was in Ireland for nearly four years. I was in college in Ireland, and I went into the theater over there. Did you kiss the Blarney Stone? Yes, I did. So did I. Yes, I, did. I really did. Yeah, they lowered you in the uh, hole, uh, head yes, first? Yes, it's a fantastic thing to do. I don't know if the people 
you have to, um, the Blarney Stone is at the top of a castle, and there's a hole in the castle wall, and you have to lie on your back and lean out about 90 feet in the air over Blarney Castle. Well, there is a, a grate that'll catch you, but it doesn't give you much reassurance as you look at it. And you've got to lean out there and somebody holds your legs. And you've got to get out underneath the wall and kiss the Blarney Stone. And then you're supposed to have the gift of, uh, of uh, what? Gab. Gab. Gab, indeed. That's it. When I think of Ireland, I, I always think, a friend of mine was a singer, and he was a protege of John McCormick, and he's pretty well known in That's Ireland. Him. John Feeney, his name was. Oh, Jack. And Jack Feeney he was, was also a, associated with a beer company. Yes, indeed. We sure. won't mention the beer company. No, but every Irishman is anyway. It was a New York beer, folks. Right. You wouldn't be drinking no. it out here. Anyway. He went to a racetrack in, in Ireland one time, a little county track, and uh, they didn't have the horses' names. They had the numbers. So he saw the number five horse was a 99 to one shot, and he gave a runner a five-pound note, and he went into a little shed to have a drink, and the race was run, and the five horse won, and everybody was booing. And John went out to collect. And as he started to walk to the window, he suddenly realized that he was the only one at the track going to the window. And now the boos were not only directed at the horse, but also at Feeney. And when he got to the ticket and he gave the man the button, and the man says, Ha, ah, Feeney, here's your money, and he was throwing the bloody stuff at him. And Feeney said, Wait a minute. He said, Why is everybody so angry? And the teller said, I'll tell you. He said, You're the only Irishman in God's world who'd bet on a horse called British Justice. <laughs> Uh, it's Carol O'Connor himself, and we'll be looking forward to seeing him on All in the Family, also listening to your new record with Gene Stapleton that's just out now. Thank you for mentioning it. Yes, Gene and I are just uh, making it. We're in the process of making a, a, an album of Archie and Edith singing at home. Oh, in response great. to... Thousands and thousands of requests. Well, as the Irish would say, may the wind always be at your back, and may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. Thank you, Carol. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Gifts presented by the Vin Sully Show are from the famous Steel Catalog Company. Over 50,000 quality items providing fashion, selections, and savings. Spiegel, Chicago, 60609. This is Johnny Gilbert speaking.